So good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to the Atos uh, chemistry webinar. So I'm Franck Lépine from CNRS in Lyon, and I will chair this session. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Marcus Dalstrom. So Marcus is a theoretician. He's a specialist of strong field and atos physics. Um, Marcus did his PhD in Lund at the Atomic Physics Department. Then he spent a few years uh, in Stockholm, in Hamburg, as a postdoc. And now he's a senior lecturer and a group leader at the Mathematical Physics Department in Lund. So as you may know, Marcus did many major contributions concerning atosegon ionization delays, double ionization processes, nonlinear processes in X-ray domain. And uh, today we'll speak about simulations of nonlinear atomic ionization processes in extreme fields. So before we start, I shall remind the audience that you will be able to ask your questions to Marcus using the live question and answer panel. And I would also recommend that you, uh, you maximize your screen in order to be able to see uh, both Marcus slides and also uh, Marcus himself uh, on your screen. So Marcus, welcome and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Frank, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, let me also thank the uh, organizers of the Atokev webinar and Aurora Ponzi in particular for inviting me to talk and, and present my work here today. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure. Um, and the title of my talk is uh, Simulations of Nonlinear Atomic Ionization Processes in Extreme Fields. And I chose to put the word extreme in uh, quotation marks here uh, because uh, I will refer to a range of different uh, fields that are extreme for different reasons. Uh, first of all, we, uh, we all know that uh, ultra short laser pulses can have extremely high intensities reaching 10 to the 14 watt per square centimeter or even higher. Uh, this means that they can be used to uh, um, to uh, to uh, run uh, highly uh, nonlinear atomic processes, uh, such as uh, to probe quantum tunneling and the generation of attosecond pulses. Now, uh, attosecond pulses themselves they are weak, but I still consider them as extreme fields because uh, they are extremely short, and uh, in particular they can be combined because they are coherently locked with laser ultra short laser pulses. They can be combined to perform um, nonlinear photoionization uh, in a way uh, that was not possible to do before. So, uh, and finally, we also have free electron laser pulses. And they are, of course, also extreme fields because they uh, already uh, combine both high intensity, uh, similar to the ultra short laser pulses, but they also have uh, high photon energies. So, the free electron laser pulses by themselves can be used to do uh, nonlinear photoionization. So, um, with this little clarification of the title, um, I want to say that today I really want to take the opportunity to introduce to you uh, the research group uh, that I'm heading. Uh, we call it the Theoretical Light Matter Dynamics uh, Group at Lund University. And we're pursuing uh, active research topics in attosecond physics, such as uh, uh, laser assisted photoionization, at the second time resolved absorption, above threshold ionization, and frustrated tunneling. And we're also looking at some problems uh, for free electron lasers, such as uh, radio oscillations. The methodologies that we have in the group, uh, they range from the diagrammatic many body perturbation theory methods. Uh, we solve the time dependent propagation uh, of the Schrodinger and the Dirac uh, equations. And uh, we consider many electron uh, correlation effects using the configuration interaction singles uh, approximation. Here on, on this slide, I show you the group members of the theoretical light matter dynamics group today. You have uh, Stefanos Kolström, who's working uh, as a postdoc in the group. 
uh, Axel Stenqvist is a, was a master thesis, uh, did his master thesis in the group and now will start as a PhD student. Uh, Edwin Olofsson is doing his uh, PhD in the group, uh, working on the strong field approximation. Uh, Jimmy Wimblad is a system development, uh, keeping track of the relativistic code. And Felipe Zapata is a postdoc, um, working also on relativistic uh, physics. Finally, Matthias Bartolino is a PhD student who's um, um, studying uh, photoelectron, photoelectrons using various uh, surface techniques, actually also uh, collaborating with uh, Stefanos. Uh, we all collaborate uh, uh, very strongly uh, in the group together to, to reach our goals. With this, uh, sh having shown you all the group members, I also need to acknowledge the support that I have from the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, uh, the Ragnar Söderberg Foundation, and the uh, Swedish Research uh, Council. Here is the outline of the talk today. Uh, I want to talk about the various uh, different methodologies we have in the group and show you some applications. First, I want to talk about the uh, diagrammatic many-body perturbation theory that has been a very useful methodology for me in order to study atomic delays in photoionization. After that, I will talk about some uh, recent work that we have done using the time-dependent configuration interaction singles method. In particular, the application is uh, laser-assisted photoionization. After that, I will switch gears and talk a little bit about the strong field approximation and, uh, and our work to understand frustrated tunneling within a simple uh, analytical uh, picture. I will end my talk uh, by talking about the uh, time-dependent Dirac equation, uh, our work on attosecond transient absorption and our very latest uh, developments in order to uh, construct the relativistic time-dependent configuration interaction singles method and show you some very uh, recent results. So I've always had a very strong uh, connection to experiments and in fact I did my PhD uh, in the group of Andelier doing both experiment and theory. So um, Thanks to this very long and strong collaboration between experiment and theory, uh, we have been uh, successful in, in uh, performing uh, some experiment and developing theory in, the, in, the, in attosecond science. And this is a good example of this. We, uh, in 2017, Marcus Isinger um, uh, published his paper in Science, where we showed that we could have solved a long-standing problem in attosecond science namely um, to understand the atomic delay in neon between the 2s and the 2p in photoionization from 2s and 2p. Um, the success here uh, was uh, not really a, the a theoretical step forward uh, but uh, an experimental one where uh, Marcus Isinger was using the rabbit technique in order to be able to take uh, the best out of the frequency domain and the time domain and combine these so that he could perform uh, uh, measurements of the uh, atomic delay uh, with the, this accuracy of few uh, attoseconds. And uh, the experiment was matching very nicely uh, the theoretical curves that I had produced uh, together with uh, Eva Lindroth. This solved a long-standing problem and it also showed that in order to reach this good agreement between theory and experiment, it was necessary to filter out other processes uh, uh, beyond the photoionization from 2p and 2s, uh, including the shakeup processes, which could strongly perturb the measurement. And this could be done because the experiment was done using the rabbit technique. So um, the Theoretical methodology we used here was diagrammatic many-body perturbation theory. And uh, over the years, we've developed this to be more and more uh, advanced. In fact, now the recent development is a full two-photon, two-color random phase approximation with exchange. That means uh, that in principle, we have a theory that's gauge invariant up to two photons. And uh, this is perfect when we want to model this type of 
uh, atomic delay experiments where we have typically one harmonic and one infrared uh, photon uh, to account for. So these are some of the perturbation diagrams that we have uh, in this methodology. With all this in place, we were sure that we would now be able to tackle a more complicated problem such as argon, uh, which has also been studied for a number of years. The uh, atomic delay uh, between uh, 3s and 3p in argon. And uh, Pascal Salier was very nice to share his recent experimental data. And we found that indeed we had good agreement uh, at high energy between experiment and theory, but at low energy, there was a discrepancy. And uh, because we were quite sure of the um, uh, theoretical calculations, we thought that it must be something else that happens in this region. So we started looking at this low energy region in argon and the delay that we saw in the 3s, 3p and um, thought, well, maybe it's also affected by these shakeup processes. And indeed, uh, diving into the literature, uh, we, we find that, uh, well, the 3p um, ionization channel is always dominant, the blue one here. Uh, the red one, the, the 3s, is not dominant or is not always the second runner up. Uh, because shakeup uh, channels can dominate over the 3s. This is because the 3s has a really sharp Cooper minimum that almost goes to zero. So um, here shakeup of a p electron to the 4p or the 3d uh, can dominate over the 3s. So what we did was we accounted for this additional ionization channel by adding it coherently to the signal um, experimentally, we couldn't see that there were two lines because it just happens to be so that the shakeup <laughs> harmonic of the shakeup sits almost exactly on top of the sideband of the 3s, making it impossible to resolve it spectrally. But um, taking this into account, we were able to better the agreement between theory and experiment, such that we believe that we have found a reason for why it's been so difficult to interpret uh, the uh, delay in argon between 3s and 3p. Going forward, uh, the uh, subject of atomic delays uh, has uh, had a lot of publications. And uh, one of the things uh, that uh, came uh, was the work from Ursula Keller's group. And this was show, uh, shown in, in helium that there was a very strong angle dependence of the atomic delays. This was first uh, published in the paper by Heuser. You can look at the atomic delay here. It's a black curve. You can see that there's almost nothing happening at, uh, at the first angles here. But as you go to larger angles around 70 or 80, all of a sudden there's a very sharp variation uh, of the atomic delay with uh, emission angle of the photoelectron. And at the time when uh, Ursula presented these uh, results to me, uh, I was uh, really inspired by it because I didn't understand it at all. Uh, the model I was using at the time was uh, not capable to explain this uh, uh, at all. But when we did ab initio simulations using many body perturbation theory or the time dependent Schrodinger equation, we saw that uh, we got the good agreement with uh, the experiment, but we didn't really understand what was going on or why it was so. So in order to uh, understand this, uh, David Busto has worked on this problem. And he has related this angle dependence of the atomic delays uh, to uh, Fano's propensity rule. So let me first uh, remind you what Fano's propensity rule is for photoionization. Fano's propensity rule goes back to uh, 85. Uh, and uh, it basically says that if you ionize an atomic system, uh, it's most likely, it's more probable that you increase your angular momentum than you decrease it. That's what the uh, Fano's propensity rule in, in photoionization says. Now, uh, what Busto uh, did was he said, well, okay, if we're already in the continuum and we absorb a laser photon, then it will be more likely to increase our angular momentum. Uh, this is basically just taking Fano's propensity rule into the continuum. And then uh, if we instead emit a laser photon, then it will be more probable that we decrease the angular momentum L. 
This should be expected because absorption and emission should be related by time uh, reversal um, symmetry. So, so this is what the picture looks like. Now, the nice thing or the surprising thing about this is that even though this is a relatively small uh, propensity that says that we should increase angular momentum or we should decrease it, it has dramatic effects in the photoelectron uh, angular distribution because this small change uh, makes the absorption path uh, have a little minima sitting here around 70 or 80 degrees and then going back up, while emission of a laser photon instead has this smooth distribution that just goes uh, down to 90 degrees and back up. And uh, the reason for why uh, there's a strong angle dependence is because when the uh, absorption path goes through um, the minima here, it acquires a pi phase shift and that leads to a large change in the phase and thus a, a fast change in the atomic delay. So uh, with this, uh, we think we have really understood stood the, the background physics of the strong angle dependence of the atomic delays. Now, uh, we want to, to go further and um, doing many body perturbation theory is very uh, hard work because uh, with each interaction, we have to add uh, many different um, perturbation diagrams and uh, to go beyond two photons, what we have done now seemed very complicated. So I thought, well, okay, I need to go to this time dependent configuration interaction singles method because here I can do nonlinear interactions by propagation. And the, the TDCIS has, a, has an ansatz where we have a time dependent n body wave function, which is uh, composed of a ground state, a single Slater determinant for the ground state of the atom. It has a time dependent amplitude, alpha zero of T, but these are static. And then the, we have uh, single excitations from this uh, ground state uh, with an uh, electron in state P and a hole in state A, and then time dependent amplitudes. This is the TDCIS. The TDCIS also has some symmetries that you can use with the singlet and, and the Gerade symmetry to reduce uh, the complexity further. But the point is we have one electron that can move around almost freely um, in the continuum and to the Rydberg states and then we have some holes that are um, fixated to the occupied orbitals of the initial state. So they move on these tracks and there are quite a few of these uh, states that the hole can jump on. That means that uh, the complexity of solving the TDCIS is not so big because we have basically one, uh, one electron problem with a certain uh, number of channels. So, uh, but it could be three channels uh, if we do neon with the 3S, uh, oh, sorry, 2S, 2P. And then we have something like uh, 6,000 states and something that's very reasonable. Now, um, if we want to look at photoelectron, there's another general problem uh, when we do time propagation. And this is that uh, eventually the electron is going to come to the end of the computational box. And then it would reflect back and create uh, unphysical interference effects. So this is a very general problem. And there are some approximate solutions that we've implemented. Uh, they were found in the literature by, by uh, Skinsey and Morales, uh, the T-surf and the I-surf. The idea is that you basically record the wave function at the radius uh, uh, before a, a damping region. And this uh, damping region leads to a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, so the norm will be lost, the wave function will disappear, but uh, if we record it before it enters this non-Hermitian region, then uh, we can uh, calculate back using the surface techniques what the, uh, what the photoelectron uh, spectrum would look like. This is not an exact method, uh, but uh, it is very useful uh, for our type of problems. So um, here are some results where we combine the TDCIS with the TSERF method. We study the process that we now uh, have learned a little bit about already, laser assisted free electron laser photonization of helium. Um, so we consider a free electron laser that ionized by one photon and then um, we absorb additionally IR photons or emit them. 
And here you can see the uh, photoelectron uh, angular distribution, uh, angle and uh, energy. So you can see the different peaks, photon peaks. And if we compare the absorption of one photon with the emission of one photon, you will see again this qualitative difference between absorption and emission. Again, you remember that this was because of Fano's uh, propensity rule that uh, I introduced earlier. Now, uh, because we do a time-dependent propagation, we also get the higher order effect. So we can look at the next sideband and then we can see again that there's a qualitative difference. The angular distributions look, uh, uh, look different because they have different number of, of uh, minima. So uh, this was helium and uh, with the TDCIS method, we can look at other atoms like neon. And here uh, we're a little bit surprised because when we did helium, uh, sorry, when we went to neon, uh, absorption and emission look qualitatively different in the uh, angular distribution of the photoelectron. While uh, when we went to the second order process where we absorb two laser photons or we emit two laser photons, we again saw a qualitative difference in the angular distributions. So this is an observation we made and, and uh, hopefully this is something that can be tested uh, using free electron lasers uh, in the future. We believe that the reason why we don't see anything here, a, qualita a qualitative uh, difference in the angular distributions here is because we have multiple M magnetic quantum numbers that mask uh, the interference effects. So uh, using this TDCIS method with the TSERF is quite fun. And, and uh, actually we can just uh, <laughs> insert some new field, fields into the input file and run and see what we get. So this is uh, <clears throat> what we started to do for a while. And we went back to an experiment that was published in 2012 uh, by uh, Laurent et al. It's a very interesting paper because uh, they do high order harmonic generation using a red blue laser or an omega two omega. And then they create an attosecond pulse train that consists of even and odd XUV harmonics. And when they did, uh, uh, when, when they did uh, photoelectron interferometry with this uh, uh, harmonic comb of even and odd harmonics, they got a nice interference pattern as a function of CP that they say looked like a, like a checkerboard. Like even, either we have the even harmonics uh, being strong or we have the odd ones being strong and we can tune this with the CFP. And uh, they only did modeling. So what we wanted to do was to see uh, if this was actually true uh, using our ab initio method from the neon atom. They proposed that there must be a pi over two phase shift between the even and the odd harmonics from HHG in order to get this uh, interference pattern. Uh, and uh, we reach agreement with their conclusion. There should be a pi over two between the even and odd. Otherwise you don't get any of this interference CP dependence at all. So that's true. But when we started looking at it, we discovered that actually this pi over two or minus pi over two, they're everywhere. <laughs> and you have to keep track of all of them. So we wrote a simple rule of thumb for above threshold ionization, which basically says that each time you interact with a laser probe field like you do here, uh, you will get um, a, a minus pi over two or a uh, minus i to the power of absolute value n uh, for the interaction. And these interaction phases, as we call them, uh, they're of course very well known from perturbation theory. Each time you do a perturbation uh, order, you get one of these factors. But here we get them from uh, the strong field approximation uh, and, and including uh, many, many uh, orders of perturbation up and down. So uh, I've shown you a, a lot of work now on laser-assisted photoionization. And uh, I started to think that, well, it's kind of complicated with these atomic delays and interaction phases and so on. Uh, perhaps there's another way to measure uh, attosecond pulses, not relying on photoelectron interferometry uh, using a laser field. So the idea was to find a way to eliminate uh, all the dipole phase and continuum continuum phases that we have in uh, at the second pulse characterization. Uh, 
and uh, there is a way to do this using Rydberg Way packets. This is this is an idea that I developed together with uh, Stefan Papst, and uh, it's a very simple idea. It's it's really just a pump probe experiment. So we say um, that we uh, we pump in some way a photo a, a uh, Rydberg Way packet. Let it evolve, and then we can photoionize it with an attosecond pulse. And if we do this, it's possible to measure uh, uh, with a with a higher precision what the temporal structure of the attosecond pulse is, uh, as compared to rabbit or the streaking method. This is what we this is what we find found out. In fact, we 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 predict that there should be no atomic delay when you do the measurement in this way. So uh, this idea hasn't really caught on, caught on in the community uh, yet. Uh, and I think one of the problems may be that there's not a, an easy way to generate a um, coherent uh, Rydberg uh, way packet of this sort that we need. So for that reason, I, I, I started to think about uh, the frustrated tunneling ionization process. Um, electrons, um, Electrons will be tunnel ionized when they're subject to a strong uh, laser field. But uh, not all of them will be ionized. Some of them will be trapped on Rydberg states. And uh, it was found by Nubemeyer that uh, it, back in uh, 2008 that actually a large portion of um, the population is trapped on Rydberg states, uh, something like 10 or 20%. Uh, that are subject to intense, ultra-short, uh, intense laser pulses that really should ionize uh, everything. But they don't. Uh, uh, electrons are trapped on Rydberg states. So the question that came to my mind is that maybe this can be used as an efficient way uh, to pump in order to create these Rydberg clocks, uh, at the second Rydberg clocks that I introduced on the previous slide. So um, we have the strong field tunneling, uh, the electron goes into the continuum, it does some classical motion in the, in the continuum, and then it will be recaptured on this Rydberg state and not ionized. So uh, incidentally, there was, uh, just at that time, there was a, a theory uh, developed and published by uh, Poprosenko uh, in 2018, uh, which uh, looks uh, very promising. Basically, it's a strong field approximation for frustrated tunneling. And um, if you've ever worked with the strong field approximation, you would be familiar with the first equation here, which basically is the condition for the stationary uh, interaction time uh, when, when, you, when you tunnel, uh, when the electron tunnels because of a strong laser field. So you can find this Ts being a complex time. Now, um, the other equations that are introduced here uh, by Poproshenko uh, uh, relates to the total final angular momentum of the uh, final Rydberg state that the electron will go to uh, and the final kinetic uh, energy. Now, uh, if we combine uh, the angular momentum and the energy condition, it's possible to substitute away uh, the uh, momentum variable P from the equation and get only one remaining uh, equation that needs to be solved for the uh, time, for the complex time interaction time Ts. And uh, we've been staring a lot at this equation trying to understand it. Uh, basically it has two terms as you can see. One is related to uh, the tunneling step, the tunneling ionization step. It depends on the ionization potential and the angular momentum. And the other uh, is, a, a, is a term um, that is relatable to the recombination probability uh, on the Rydberg state. Now, uh, looking at the solutions to this equation, we find uh, that there are actually many solutions. Uh, so we label them by alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And uh, the alpha solution, uh, you can see here, it's born a little bit after uh, the field peak, the electric field peak here shown in black, it's born after. And then it goes out and then it comes back and it recombines or it recollides with the ion. Here it can rescatter or it can emit uh, high order harmonics. It's one of the usual strong field trajectories that we know and love. Now, um, there are other solutions as well uh, to these uh, Poprosenko equations. And uh, these are these beta solutions. They're actually bo born a little bit before uh, the electric field peak. And that means that they 
it slowly drift away and never uh, recollide with the ion. So in that way, they can uh, be trapped uh, on uh, Rydberg states. Solving these equations, we also found other uh, solutions, uh, gamma and delta, uh, which we think are wholly unphysical and that we have uh, uh, disregarded uh, in our implementation. In order to check if this uh, strong field approximation makes uh, sense, uh, we've also solved uh, the problem using uh, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And uh, let me just show you a little bit the complexity here. Actually, solving this problem is not so complicated uh, to solve uh, numerically. So uh, we look at a typical intensity 10 to the 14 watt per centimeter square, typical laser photon energy 1.55 electron volt. Then we have an electron ponderative motion of about 20 Bohr radii. Um, so we need to have a radial box that's big enough to, to keep uh, the electron inside. Um, the other parameter that we need to think about uh, doing frustrated tunneling is the size of the Rydberg wave packet, sorry, the Rydberg state. And this goes like n square. So again, if we look at the very modest Rydberg state, uh, n is equal to 5, then we would have 25 Bohr radii. And again, this is very typical, uh, uh, no problem um, uh, to, to solve numerically. So we would have 2000 states, no problem. So we can solve this, uh, say, exactly numerically, and we compare our results for a four-cycle laser pulse. This is the uh, strong field approximation frustrated tunneling, and this is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And uh, in order to get this uh, level of agreement between, uh, between the theories, we, were able, we had to extend Poprosenko's uh, theory, including the pulse envelope, uh, quantum diffusion, uh, projection prefactors and a complex trajectory filter in order to select the trajectories that we think are uh, physical solutions. Um, as you can see, uh, there's some um, weak uh, CEP dependence that's found both in the TDSE simulations and in the uh, strong field uh, approximation. The interesting thing about the strong field approximation for frustrated tunneling is that we can look at these interaction times and we can see uh, how the alpha solution and beta solution uh, develop uh, as a function of principal quantum number and as a function of angular momentum. In fact, uh, if we increase the angular momentum, what will happen is that uh, the trajectories will uh, not be able to uh, recombine with the Rydberg state, according to this theory. Um, and, and we can see that, uh, in fact, they split up and become uh, and, and, and diverge in the complex uh, plane. So we have to select only uh, the, the physical solutions there as well. So there's a lot of complex filtering going on to select the trajectories. In order to understand if these interaction times are really physical, we're also working on uh, solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, but within exact Dyson series expansion. And here, um, what we find is that um, uh, frustrated tunneling favors uh, high angular momentum states, the G wave and the F wave for the N is equal to five, while <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, analytical theory, the strong field approximation, uh, 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 shows in fact that uh, lower angular momentum uh, is dominant. So this is something uh, very preliminary that we're uh, trying to understand at the moment. Uh, I will now jump to the last uh, part uh, of my talk, and this is the work that we're doing going towards relativistic physics. Uh, in particular, uh, what we're doing is we're solving um, the time-dependent Dirac equation. And uh, you may ask why we want to solve uh, the Dirac equation. And uh, the rationale for this is that if we solve the Dirac equation, we get uh, a number of relativistic effects uh, for free or included already from the beginning. They include a spin orbit interaction, relativistic mass effects, and the Darwin term. 
the uh, an, an additional challenge with the Dirac equation is that we don't have a one component or two component wave function. We have this four component wave function. And um, the, the most interesting uh, thing about the Dirac equation that has been uh, discussed since its invention is the positive and negative energy states, also called the Dirac C, how to treat the Dirac C. So um, drawing very schematically this here uh, to the right, we have the positive energy states that are uh, close to mc square or higher. Uh, and then we have the negative energy states, which are below uh, minus mc square. Uh, and these, uh, in order to interpret the, the Dirac C, one approach is to say that the Dirac C is full and therefore uh, by Pauli's exclusion principle, no electrons can go there. But uh, it, it's really not so easy. <laughs> and uh, in, real, in real QED, uh, pair production is, is, is a phenomena that can happen. We can create an electron and a positron. Uh, and then we need to, uh, to, to uh, some way uh, include these uh, negative energy states. This is important in, in really the relativistic limit uh, if we have very high uh, charge of the ion or if we want to go to ultra strong uh, lasers. Um, if we go a little bit uh, further down uh, in, on this extreme axis, uh, we, we will have uh, non-dipole effects on the laser field that the vector potential must be described by both its time and space coordinates. Moving down further, it's possible to remain within a, a dipole approximation, saying that the vector potential or the electric field only depends on time. Uh, he, within this bubble of approximation, we can still reach intermediate uh, charge, uh, ion charge, uh, and intermediate, or I can call them extreme laser fields here. Um, and uh, going down further on this axis, eventually we will come to the non-relativistic limit where we have a low uh, nuclear charge and, and the weak perturbative uh, lasers. So an inspiration for this uh, uh, axis here is, was taken from uh, Vanne and Science, where they show actually the scalings and that it's possible to stay within the dipole approximation and still do uh, relativistic, uh, uh, relativistic uh, physics within the dipole approximation. And <clears throat> uh, it's interesting to study, uh, to, 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 to solve the Dirac equation because we can look at these atoms that have intermediate Z, where in fact we have a sizable spin orbit effect compared to uh, the laser photon energy. So uh, a short overview of the time-dependent Dirac equation. Um, the first thing you notice is that it looks just like the Schrodinger, time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, of course, uh, that's not really true. Uh, the Hamiltonian is different. We have uh, written here in the traditional alpha, beta with the alpha and beta operators, we have uh, a, a kinetic term, uh, C uh, times alpha dot P. Um, alpha or alpha C is known as a uh, velocity operator. It's uh, uh, defined here. So if we have velocity uh, multiplied by momentum, we get uh, our usual uh, kinetic uh, energy. And then we have the mass term and we have a static Coulomb potential. Now, um, we, we solved the... Um, we studied the time-dependent Dirac equation and formulated a relativistic version for attosecond transient absorption. And uh, what we get is actually starting from the length gauge or from the velocity gauge. In the length gauge, where we have uh, the dipole uh, position operator uh, uh, times the electric field, we get uh, an equivalent form as you find non-relativistically. The only difference, in fact, is that uh, the uh, position operator here as a function of uh, photon energy it should be evaluated using, using the uh, four component wave function. But the actual form of the expression is the same as the non-relativistic case. The more interesting uh, result was uh, looking at the velocity gauge, we found that the uh, spectrally resolved uh, absorbed energy 
uh, is is uh, depends on this velocity operator alpha, which is a two, which is a, something um, say unique to the time dependent Dirac equation. So that's nice. We have that. We should look at the z component for a linearly polarized um, field uh, of the velocity operator times the vector potential. In the um, in the um, non-relativistic limit, what we have is actually the velocity operator as well, but the, but the, uh, uh, the P plus A uh, operator here. So uh, it all makes sense. And actually, we, we, we verified uh, propagating the time-dependent Dirac equation and the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for hydrogen, so within the non-relativistic limit, uh, and we found perfect agreement between uh, the Dirac equation and the Schrodinger uh, for the, for the process of one photon ionization. Now, um, the uh, motivation for going to the Dirac equation is that we uh, wanted to tackle the, the relativistic time-dependent configuration interaction singles method. And in order to do this, we make a similar ansatz as, as is done in the non-relativistic case. Uh, we take a Slater determinant from the Dirac Fock uh, as the ground state, and then we uh, generate all single excitations. Again, this means that we have one free electron that can move around, but it's coupled to an ion. And uh, the difference uh, compared to before is that both have this relativistic J uh, coupling. So um, uh, we, uh, we stay within the dipole approximation. We use the length gauge uh, with a complex absorbing potential. Uh, this allows us to um, propagate only using the positive energy states, uh, which is a kind of a no pair approximation. Again, saying that the active space that we have uh, is here and we uh, don't include the, uh, we treat the Dirac C as being frozen and occupied. Looking at the complexity of solving the uh, RTDCIS, uh, we have uh, quite uh, uh, a number of states now, but it can still be done on a single uh, uh, workstation. So uh, here are some results uh, solving uh, the uh, relativistic time-dependent configuration interaction singles. These are results for the xenon atom uh, with an active space of the uh, 4D, 5S, and uh, 5P. And here you can see the expected uh, final resonances at the 5S edge. Uh, you can also see uh, final resonances at the 4D edge here. And uh, following this, uh, we see uh, the giant uh, resonance, uh, which is located here. In order to verify that the propagation that we've done is uh, consistent and correctly implemented, we have compared uh, our uh, time-dependent results, the red curve, with many-body perturbation theory. And uh, excellent agreement is found with many-body perturbation theory within the uh, so-called tam dankov approximation. Here you can see the very good agreement between the red and the black uh, line. Um, it is known uh, that the, ra the relativistic random phase approximation is an even better uh, approximation for a uh, single photon ionization of this atom of xenon. Uh, and you can see that there is a sizable difference here due to uh, correlation effects that are not included in the CIS uh, or in the Tam Dankov approximation. But this is to be expected. <laughs> So uh, what we can do is we can look uh, at xenon uh, with uh, various uh, different approximations. We can look at the, uh, uh, we can restrict the active space. And what we find is actually that this giant resonance in xenon is actually even too large uh, as opposed to how it, um, it's even too large as compared to experiment, which is shown here in ice blue. Uh, but by restricting the active space to only include the 4D, uh, the size of the giant resonance is reduced. And uh, further using experimental energy for the binding energy of, of the 4D also shifts uh, the uh, cross-section closer to the experimental one. 
this said, uh, the relativistic random phase approximation is uh, a better approximation for one photon ionization, and, 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 and this is well known. But uh, the rationale for doing uh, all this uh, propagation and development is that we want to be able to study pump probe experiments uh, by two or, or, or more uh, photons. And then um, we think that this relativistic time-dependent configuration interaction singles can be an interesting uh, methodology. This uh, summarizes uh, uh, my talk. I've, I've shown you uh, results that we have uh, done in Atosic and Science, including uh, atomic delays, where I showed you that inclusion of incoherent shakeup processes uh, will be very essential in, in future works in that direction. Um, I, I showed you uh, some results uh, of frustrated tunneling and that the, dis the distributions over L quantum number need to be refined in the strong field approximation. Uh, I showed you uh, our uh, results for the transient absorption in the relativistic formulation based on the Dirac equation. Um, for free electron laser applications, I showed you how photoelectron angular distributions uh, can be understood um, uh, using Fano's propensity rule for uh, transitions in the continuum. And finally, uh, I showed um, the way to make relativistic uh, pump probe experiments using the RTDCIS. Finally, um, pointing out the future goals of the group, uh, we're very interested to pursue these Atto Rydberg clocks, uh, working on the setup of uh, Rydberg wave packets, how to read out these wave packets, and how they can be used uh, to couple to the environment and, and, and how they uh, affect each other. So, with this, I, I, I want to uh, thank you for your attention and, and please, um, uh, you can send uh, your questions um, to, um, to Frank. Thank you very much, Marcus, for this very, uh, very impressive talk. So you can ask your question. So there's a question from Fernando, Fernando Martin. So very nice talk. How difficult would it be to go beyond CIS in both the non-relativistic and relativistic approaches? As far as, far as I understood, you only need a workstation to do CIS. So I do not think that there are limitations associated to the computational sources. So, uh, go going beyond the CIS is a, it is a very big step and, and it would uh, uh, take many man hours to uh, write down uh, uh, the theory and implement it into codes and develop. I mean, um, in principle, uh, it is possible. In practice, right now, uh, we're very happy with, <laughs> with the CIS uh, approach. Um, the, the problem is really, the bottleneck is really the number of channels that we have. And, and this, is, this is why the CIS is so powerful, because uh, as I explained, the, the holes, um, the, the holes are, are, are uh, run on these tracks that are the occupied orbitals of the initial Slater determinant. And they are uh, not so many. Actually, with the relativistic, <laughs> relativistic code, they also become uh, sizable. I mean... Uh, tense and, 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 and larger. But, but, um, but as soon as we start to up, uh, go beyond the singles, um, we have so many of these uh, shake-up channels. Like shake-up is also a double excitation. Um, and and, and this, is very, this is very difficult. Um, but so, so this is something that we would like to do, but we're not doing uh, at the moment. Thank you. you for the question, uh, Fernando. Is there any other question? So I have one. You were mentioning this um, Atto Rydberg clock. So as far as I understood, you you think about a single electron wave packet composed of a certain distribution of angular momenta. Uh, would that be interesting to do such uh, such experiment, but with a two electron wave packets, and then you will measure the two electrons in coincidence and so on. Would you learn, I mean, would that be just much more complicated, but 
or would it be actually interesting to, to learn something about electron correlation or something like that? So you create uh, a, a two electron with your ref packet and then you, you okay. analyze it and so on. So, so let, let's see if I, if I understand the, uh, the question here. So, so the idea would, the idea would be to um, excite uh, into a two electron uh, uh, state, a many body state that has two electrons excited rather than yes. just one. Yeah. Um, um, which well, you can do and with bird physics, uh, which you can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you're talking about uh, launching um, first one uh, electron and then uh, say another electron into another, I mean, much higher uh, Rydberg state. Um, so that you have uh, a, a charge of two, uh, effective charge of two in the ion, and you have these two electrons uh, rotating around. I mean, this, yeah, this is this is uh, this is uh, also a very interesting idea. It, it, it's not the scope uh, that we had. Uh, the the idea here was to sort of make something that was uh, enormously simple, and uh, and then at the same time uh, we could. Um, make measurements that don't depend on the atomic structure, on the uh, scattering uh, phase and so on. Uh, this is what we were doing here. But I'm very interested in, in, in taking uh, the Rydberg states here and, and, and going to higher Rydberg states and see what can happen. Uh, it's an interesting idea. I haven't, I haven't really thought much about uh, having double excited uh, really, yeah, double excited. Here, here uh, the goal would be really to actually study the electron correlation in right, the right, 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 right. That that's a that's a that, yeah it's a super interesting uh, problem. Uh, we haven't uh, done anything with that uh, with our methodology now. We cannot really do it, but it sounds like something that we would more study by 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 a model uh, first. I think because it's essentially hydrogen hydrogenic. Uh, uh, states, I think, can use there. So that, that's is, a very, very yeah. interesting uh, question. <laughs> Some more work to do in your team. Some more, a, lo a lot of more work, yeah. <laughs> is there any other question uh, for Marcus? I still have plenty, but... Uh... Okay, I can continue. Uh, how difficult is it to extend your uh, your methodology to different uh, polarization states? Is it just a matter of cost or calculation yeah, cost? This is or... a matter of, yeah, this is a matter of cost. Uh, in fact, when we do the non-relativistic calculations, we follow uh, the work uh, from Robin Santra's group where they use the singlet approximation in order to uh, get rid of the spin up and spin down. And then uh, we use the Gerard symmetry as well in order to uh, further reduce the uh, uh, magnetic quantum number. This is to reduce the number of channels. Um, uh, if we want to do elliptical uh, fields, uh, in principle, uh, that's, uh, that's, that, that is easy to do, uh, or it can be done, but we haven't done it. Um, uh, in, in this code. And, and one reason for that is also that uh, Stefanos Kolström, who's working in the group, he, he already has one of these implementations in, in the two component uh, uh, CIS code. Um, so so uh, if there's an interesting uh, problem to do there, I mean, I know uh, a lot of attention is, is going into the elliptical fields at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a code that, that, can, uh, that can tackle this as well. There is a question from Shaikat Nandi that you know. Uh, is it possible to include two photon ionization for the relativistic case? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, two photon ionization. Yes, of, yes. So, um, we can. We can. When we propagate, we already get the. Uh, two photon uh, ionization uh, dynamics. Uh, um, but um, now um, it's about the uh, output, I mean, the, uh, the observable that we want to look at. And, uh, and here we're working on, um, on, uh, on developing a, a uh, 
surface method also for, for the time dependent Dirac equation. But this is not, uh, this is uh, still uh, work that we're doing at the, at, at the moment. And uh, it's not something we have uh, ready uh, yet. But in principle, this is, this is definitely one of the targets that we're going for in order to be able to measure or, or simulate photoelectrons from the Dirac equation. Uh, this would include two photons would be the, I mean, it's the simplest after the one photon. Uh, uh, I mean, after second transient absorption, we could study with one photon and with uh, two photon. I, I don't know if I, if I had uh, this on the slide there, but... Uh, um, at the second transient absorption, we have done uh, also for nonlinear uh, processes. Um, no, it's not there. Yeah, uh, but looking at photoelectrons, this is this is work that we're doing now. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question for Marcus? No. Well, I just take this occasion because um, you, you mentioned a lot of these rare gas uh, atoms. Uh, so my question is with this uh, relativistic uh, uh, computation that you have, uh, I guess it becomes accessible to study much more exotic atoms like metallic atoms and so on. A apart from the fact that now you you can include relativistic effects. Uh, is there any limitation that you that will stop you to study uh, I mean, whatever uh, tungsten or whatever more exotic atoms that you actually could be able to study in a, in more sophisticated experiments that we have now? Yeah. So. So this uh, CIS is still CIS, and, and it still starts from a, 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 a field uh, shell. So actually, uh, it doesn't have to be noble gas atoms, but they have to be noble gas atom-like. So, so we want to start from, uh, from targets that have a field shell. So what we can do is we can go to negative ions uh, or positive ions. Um, uh, change the ch uh, charge yeah, up, actually, and, yeah. and, uh, and the other thing which is very interesting, which, which is this paper by Vanne and Science that I, that I pointed to, is that we can do a lot of things changing the effective charge uh, of, of the ion, going into uh, really uh, exotic conditions for the, for the laser fields, or for the fields. Uh, but uh, but still stay within the dipole approximation and uh, and uh, within our um, CIS. I think. Um, so. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Fernando. Continuum continuum delays are omnipresent in all rabbit experiments. The only way to get rid of them is to have estimations from theory or to hope that they cancel out by subtracting measured delays associated with different sidebands. But this is not possible when the continuum has a lot of structure, for instance, resonances. Uh, I would like to know, I would like to know uh, your view about how to go further with this idea in the general case. Okay. Um, um... This is this is uh, also a, a good point. So in the in the experiments I showed, I think I think we were not uh, the problems uh, say in interpretation that we had were not that we were running over one of these uh, final resonances. There's a lot of work done, of course, by Fernando and and uh, Luca Agenti and and, uh, and and others on 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 how to treat the. Uh, uh, continuum uh, transitions when you are close to the final resonance. Uh, I think uh, I think this is just uh, um, what, what becomes really interesting. I think is when we start to drive the transition, say the final resonance here, by fields that are non-perturbative themselves, and we start to have these uh, fluctuating, Robbie oscillating. Uh, uh, systems that we want to probe so that we go beyond the, the perturbative uh, picture of, of the photoionization. I think this is something that, 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 uh, that is interesting. Uh, you have a 
decaying uh, auto decaying or auto ionizing state and then you you probe it uh, uh, with some uh, strong ultraviolet field and and, uh, and here um, well, uh, continuum continuum phases. They they are they, they are they are they are they are, they are, It's physics that happens when you do uh, transitions in the continuum. I mean, <laughs> you cannot expect that they will happen also when you do transitions uh, in the between bound states. Uh, in fact, this is the point of this uh, of of photoionization from Rydberg wave packets. That then we go into an intermediate state that has this that has bound bound wave packet. And then going into the continuum from there is just a one photon ionization uh, process, and it doesn't have any of these uh, continuum continuum phases. Uh, in fact, even even the scattering phases uh, will cancel. Uh, in that case, because we go from different Rydberg states, so we have the spectral sharing that we need, uh, but we go to the same final state, the same final state that has the same scattering state. So. Um, so I'm not sure I answered your question. <laughs> I'm sorry, but 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 it but it's uh, I, I think it's amazing how much work has happened in the last uh, ten years about understanding uh, measurements of attosecond pulses and and uh, structure, nonlinear dynamics using attosecond pulses. Yeah, yeah. So okay, is there any other question for Marcus? Because now we are actually out of time. So if there is no other question, I would like to thank Marcus very much for his great talk and for the discussion. And uh, yeah, I will thank the audience for joining this session and uh, let's meet at the next uh, webinar of Atokin. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>